Praise Jesus, hallelujah. And here we are with the Peterson Chronicles, Angel Wars, and the Luciferian Rebellion, show number 67. <laughs> hallelujah. Woo! Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, Father God, we just pray that this will edify people. Those of us who are still in the process, we're all in the process of waking up, Father. We're all, you know, hopefully we don't get puffed up inside. Hopefully, Father God, we can remain humble and realize that your universe is so awesome. And it's not just a hologram. It's very real. Father, may we never crush you down into a tiny little 12-ounce can. Help us to understand your glory. How awesome you are. How huge these universes and multi multi-dimensions are. How amazing it is that there's trillions of life forms out there. Trillions of stars. Star systems. Galaxies. Multiple dimensions, parallel universes, Father, wormholes, stargates. How awesome it is, Father God, that it's not just science fiction, but science fact in so many ways. We praise you for your awesomeness. We praise you for your awesomeness. And we pray in Jesus' name, Father God, that there is not one thing, not one sin, not one earthly tendency that we have within us that would prevent us from loving you with all of our heart and our mind and our soul in such a fashion that we're not willing to turn completely against all things on this earth and focus 100% of our attention on our Lord Jesus Christ, focusing 100% of our attention on seeking you in righteousness and holiness so that maybe we are able to partake as fellow heirs in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Maybe we would be chosen to be able to participate at that level across all of these universes some some millennium some time in the distant, distant future. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. We live in an amazing, amazing, amazing time, folks. It is just unbelievable. Uh, and wow, I mean, how hard can it possibly be to be, I mean, I, 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 I'm speechless sometimes when I get my one of the things I one of the reasons I really enjoy doing these shows the Peterson Chronicle shows is because it allows us to expand you know we, we it's almost like a form of escape from this reality that in our matrix that we're you know ultimately trapped in right now you know whether or not we're in some sort of Stephen King dome you know some sort of uh, I don't know uh, firmament dome where we're stuck in this, you know, containment zone intergalactically, and we can look out through the dome into the galaxies of the glorified star systems that have not, that are not in a fallen state in some cases, you know, maybe parts of them aren't, who knows? You know, we don't know exactly what parts of our hypothesis are accurate and what parts are not. All we can do is take, you know, the body of knowledge or information that's out there, pray about it, and just see how we feel about it as we seek the Lord. And not everybody arrives at the same conclusions because we all have different environmental variables and historical understandings of things and different experiences that lead us to stuff. Uh, but, you know, at least it, I would hope that, that, that people would have a humble and contrite spirit and be willing, you know, especially if they're interested in such things. I mean, these are not things that are going to make you go to heaven. Okay, these are not going to get you through the narrow gate. Okay, these are possibilities, possibilities that exist uh, because it's out there. You know, if the Father didn't want us to be able to see into his creation and be awed by it, uh, then he would have created our atmosphere, e.g. E the air, as the Bible refers to it in some cases, uh, 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 the high places, uh, would not be visible. You know, there wouldn't be references to the hosts of heaven in the Bible. What's a host? You know, the simplified three-year-old version of a host is a planet you know, ultimately, something out there. But it's much bigger than that. The, the term host is, the scope of the term host is really fantastic when you consider the possibilities of what the word host could mean. So it really makes things exciting when you take a second look at the, especially the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, and wonder to yourself how much of what we see in the Hubble Space Telescope, how much of it is in a fallen state demonically trapped into a sandbox of entropy 
and, de and, and degradation, and how much of that might be part of a glorified sector of star systems that are outside of the realm of our, I don't know, not outside of our imagination, certainly, but maybe outside of the attack zone of the forces of darkness, you know, da 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 you know, that kind of thing. Who knows? Praise Jesus. What we do know, and we played it on the show multiple times, and the Lord led us to this. Believe you me, there, the supernatural leading of the Father, of our Heavenly Father, has been upon this ministry for a very long time. Are we saying we have everything right? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, what we're saying is we probably have a whole bunch of it wrong. But it's still exciting to think about it. Okay, it's not. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. You know, it's it's all about Jesus. Every single word of the sixty six book book canon, when properly understood, not contextually but spiritually discerned, right? Amen. Uh, that's that's a very high high watermark spiritual discernment, because head knowledge is pretty much what Jesus admonished the Pharisees of being. At the same time, Jesus warned that if we do not have the righteousness of the Pharisees, we will not make it into heaven. Wow. So on one hand, Jesus says, you, you know, serpents, you, 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 he calls them serpents. He calls the Pharisees bad things. And then on the other hand, he says that if you don't have the righteousness of the Pharisees, you're not going to make it into heaven. Wow, that's kind of an interesting dynamic, right? But so the Pharisees' head knowledge, their head knowledge of the Scripture, pointing to certain texts and saying, you're not doing this according to what it says right here. You are not doing this right here, and you're going to go to hell. That is Pharisaical. That's exactly what Jesus, who was the Lord of the Sabbath... <laughs> Imagine that, God in the flesh, standing there in front of these guys who are accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. The problem is that we have to spiritually discern with our heart, through love, through love, what is the right thing. And most theologians, I don't want to pick on theologians at large, but most people who are students of theology go to college, dig deep, not all of them, not all of them, but most of them, are full of all kinds of head knowledge. And they go back, and, and that head knowledge, spiritual understanding of the Scripture, not everybody, I don't think, has the ingredients in their DNA to be able to get there, honestly. Uh, I don't know why that is. I don't understand the dynamics of that. I'm just here to, I'm holding up my hands. I, I don't get it. I don't know. And am I pretending that I have the secret formula for Coca-Cola here? Absolutely not. But what I what you can see throughout the Bible and in your daily walk as as a hopefully a capital C Christian, somebody who, you know, loves Jesus and the Father with all their heart and is obedient to the scripture and seeking and praying to be sin free and practicing righteousness. Hopefully your sanctification process is in full swing and as it says in Second Corinthians seven one Knowing these things, brethren, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness through the fear of God. Wow. When's the last time your pastor did a sermon on that one? See, the reference to the filthiness of the flesh used to bother me. I was like, what is that? But then I remembered. I remembered. I remembered the ministry of Dr. Caroline Leaf, a neurologist who loves Jesus, who goes around the world showing people that as a neurologist with all kinds of fancy electronic equipment, she's able to detect and do imaging of the neurological system of Christians versus unbelievers. And she's able to map out electronically, create an electronic map, a mapogram of, of a person's neurological system. And she can document a physiological change with electronic systems, sensors. A huge difference between unbelievers and people who love the Lord and are seeking Him. 
The sanctification process is tangible and real. It's not just some nebulous spiritual thing that we can't put our fingers on. It is real. That's why Jesus said, if you are not born again, you're not coming into heaven. He was talking about a tangible, real change to our DNA. Wow. Now let's take a second look at 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Now knowing these things, brethren, let us cleanse ourselves. Let us, let us all, let us all cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of the flesh, DNA, and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The fear of God is the motivating factor. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's the motivating factor. And if you don't have true fear of God, then you potentially are in very deep, deep trouble. <laughs> because it is a fundamental element of getting to where you need to be in your sanctification process. It is the ultimate motivation, understanding that you are in jeopardy. As soon as you think you have that golden ticket into heaven, you are in trouble. We must seek God in fear, and that will motivate us to reach the place that we need to be to accelerate our sanctification process, knowing that when we sin, when, when, we do sin. We must confess of our sins, for he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, nine. It's a dynamic process that happens cyclically, but will continue to be progressive, providing that one fears God and really loves him at the same time and continues to seek him with fervor. When you continue that process over and over again with fervor, because you're obsessed with God, you love, you, you're adherent, if you will, and compliant to the number one and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, which, of course, is so huge that most of us could never imagine what that really means. It's an obsession that can't be quantified. Wow. But when you activate that obsession, when you activate that process, when you become compliant to that process, that's when the filthiness of the flesh and spirit can be purified. And that's when you can start the real born-again sanctification process, where your DNA actually changes, where your spiritual elements actually change. For example, with fasting, most, the Lord showed me this. It took me a long time and a lot of prayer to understand this. But for those of you who are interested in fasting, why does fasting work? It's like an equalizer. For those of you who understand the concept of an audio equalizer, imagine one of the old-style equalizers that has a series of bars that go across, and each bar is in a range of frequencies. Now I'll set the equalizer to flat and also make the assumption for this analogy that everything below 4K hertz, everything below 4 kilohertz on your equalizer is of the flesh. It's of the body, of the physical body and the earthly part of your existence. Now, your life is now playing, your body, soul, spirit, energy matrix is now playing in the matrix. It's, it's playing. It's music that is playing now through this equalizer that is set to flat. And now you decide you're going to fast to draw closer to the Lord. So you take all of the sliders below 4K and you push them down. You depress the flesh when you push all of those sliders down, look at the waveform on your life song that is playing. Now, the spiritual part is amplified because you've depressed the earthly part. 
And that spiritual amplified part in that waveform now has a stronger connectivity back to the Heavenly Father. How awesome is that? This is all very tangible stuff nowadays. We have the understanding today, technologically, with the advanced information that the Lord has allowed us to have ultimately. Even some of it coming through the forces of darkness. Because believe me, the sandbox that God has these entities in is very strong. And he only lets out what he wishes, ultimately. Praise God. Uh, So it is... Just so exciting when you get all this stuff. You know, it's it's bits and pieces of this stuff, and you start to say, "Wow, what are the possibilities?" You know, uh, how huge is this opportunity? Anyway, praise Jesus. It's very, very exciting. And I'm going to play for you real quick before we bring on... I'm hoping Brother Kenneth will be able to click in. Uh, I know there's been uh, some challenges with Blog Talk Radio uh, going through some changes on their end. Uh, It has caused us to have a couple of glitches on two shows back-to-back. And, of course... plummets our numbers, you know, the number of listeners, because people's level of tolerance for technical difficulties nowadays is not really high, especially in the realm of all the wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, and all the awful things that are happening across the world right now. That's what makes this, I think, what makes this show so fun now, is it's almost like a little bit of a holy escape from the the pressing, twisted, mind control garbage that unfortunately we are subject to trapped in this Jesus version of the Stephen King dome (laughs) here on earth, right? (laughs) In this fallen state. We're stuck with it. (laughs) Praise Jesus. And it's part of a test that we have to go through. And that test has an end result. And that end result is to be raised up as a royal priesthood, co-heirs of, what, the universe? With Jesus? How awesome is that? But we have a long, long way to go. And eternity is a really long, long time. So, anyway, in the spirit of uh, all this cool stuff, I think it's cool. It's exciting to me. Praise Jesus. Um, uh, 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 Here is a clip. I just love this. I love it. It's thought-provoking. I'm going to play this uh, clip on, uh, uh, it's from uh, Dimitru Dudeman speaking. And um, let me see if I can find this. I have a lot of Dudeman clips on the radio show. Oh, here it is. Now, listen to this. I just think this is so fascinating because in the grand scheme, I remember the day, I remember the day, it was actually late at night, about 1 a.m., maybe 12, 12, 12 uh, a.m.-ish. It was late at night. And I was talking to Brother Lauren on a Skype phone call. And... uh, he brought up this notion of his that um, that God's angels would sometimes actually use technologies. And I was like, let's just put it this way. I was less than kind in my rebuke. <laughs> I had not come to the, you know... <sighs> point that I am now, whatever point that might be in my walk with the Lord, and um, I let I bomb I lambasted him. I was like, "You're insane! You're crazy!" I think I even dropped a couple of unsavory, colorful colloquialisms on him. So, Brother Lauren is is a very tolerant, good, godly man. Praise Jesus for him, because he could have easily just unplugged the the. the uh, or press the Skype disconnect button, but he hung in there. And you know, it's fascinating is here we are years and years later. We have the testimony of ha- Pastor Howard Storm who confirmed that there's zillions of life forms. I don't know what the number, let's just say bunches and bunches of life forms out in the universe. He went to heaven. He had the smarts to ask Jesus the ultimate question, is extraterrestrial life real? 
And Jesus let loose on him and said, oh, yes, it is. Let me show you. And just paraded all these different beings, some humanoid, some very Star Trekian, some very Star Warsian. <laughs> Remember the Star Wars uh, episodes where they're in various bars or sundry places across the universe and there's all these different creatures. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, evidently, the, some of the creatures that Jesus paraded in front of, front of Pastor Howard Storm uh, were pretty creepy. <laughs> because he was like, okay, 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 I've seen enough. I've seen enough. He actually kind of called off the show. <laughs> Praise God. <sighs> you know, it's bigger than we, you know, we we felt it. I rejected it, rejected many of these concepts initially because I, I didn't have enough information. I lit my metaphorical uh, uh, uh Torch, grabbed my pitchfork, and Granny and I went running after Brother Peterson. <laughs> we are going to string him up. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he hung in there. And now, let's take a listen. This is fascinating. Let's take a listen to uh, Pastor uh, Dimitri Dudeman when he was still alive, uh, speaking in a church. Now, you have to listen very carefully. Um, because, and you might say when you're listening to this, oh, that that must be a Freudian slip. Uh, he didn't really mean that. Uh, you know, if you're still in the hey, I'm rejecting all this advanced stuff mode, uh, God's angels would never use any form of a technology, even a symbiotic technology like the one described in Ezekiel chapter one. Uh, uh, but you know, uh, Ezekiel's wheel, which is ugh, that is just too cool. Um, but 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 you know, just before. Before I play this, just remember this one point, and this is something that Brother Peterson shared with me that helped me you know, nudge me over the hill, over the hump a little bit. Even if you're a supernatural being, if you are in a particular host body, like the angelic beings that were going to get Lot, notice that they did not, they weren't so supernatural as the angel in Daniel chapter 9 and 10, I believe it's chapter 10, with, with, with the eyes of lightning and the face of Beryl or something like that, that freaked, you know, that one there obviously was some type of a spirit being, obviously. And then the ones that were referred to as men, because it's fascinating that the Bible actually uses the word men. Why is that? Could it be because they're in host bodies of men? At the time, I think so. Because they didn't materialize. Lot's angels did not beam themselves out of the house. They did not open a supernatural doorway through the back of the house and escape from the you know the less than desirable people on the outside of the door, banging on the door. But they did have enough supernatural energy power to strike blindness into the people on the other side of the door. Possibly with a blast of glory light. Who knows? A brilliant blast of glory light, maybe. Who knows? All hypotheses. But we, what we can determine is that they were in some type of a host body that limited their ability to some extent to leverage the type of supernatural power that the angel that came upon Daniel in chapter 10 had with a, with a eyes of lightning and face of barrel or whatever. That was... Definitely not somebody that you would unwittingly entertain as an angel over tea and scrambled eggs. <laughs> I am not passing a plate of scrambled eggs to an entity on the other side of the table with eyes of barrel and a face of lightning. Sorry. That's where I draw the line. I don't care how patient Brother Peterson is with me. <laughs> but anyway, if you're in, for some reason, if you're in a host body, then you're going to need protection. Because now you are susceptible to the elements. What capabilities, why did God send two angel men to help Lot instead of the same type of angel that was sent to give the message to Daniel in, 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 in Daniel 10? Why the two different types of beings? Had to be a reason. There's got to be some type of limitations associated with angelic abilities 
based upon what type of host body that they're in, what type of matrix system that they're in at that time to require certain dynamics to be in play. And if that be the case, then if they're in a men, if they're angel men in host bodies, then, you know, yea, saith the Lord of hosts, yea, saith the Lord of hosts, watch the movie Starman, buy yourself a copy, even if you got to get it secondhand, with Jeff Bridges in it. Excellent movie. Praise God. Praise God. And I'll even have a couple scenes that make you cry in it. All right? But anyway, if you're in a host body, angel man body, then you're going to need protection from the elements. Why would you have to be in an angel man body in outer space? I don't know. Maybe there's a real war taking place out there. Could there be? Could it be real? Is there really a war in the heavens? Are they shooting laser beams at each other? And if they are, and they have to be in angel men bodies, like the ones that visited Lot's house, then, hmm, might they need technologies? I don't know. But anyway, let's listen to Dimitri Dunman. This is one minute and 28 seconds long, but this is fascinating. Praise Jesus. Listen to this. Listen carefully. He says it quick. But it's really cool. Praise Jesus. I was sitting outside on a rock. It was very late at night. I was just crying before God. And all of a sudden, I heard light coming towards me. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I thought it was a car. When I saw the light, I heard the the same voice. It was the same angel, which had been with me in prison, which had been at my house, which was with me in Italy. He said, Dimitri, why are you so despairing? Well, what did I do that you punished me so harshly? Why did you bring me to this country? I don't even have a place to head down. He said, Dimitri, I brought you to this country because this country will burn. So why did you bring me here to burn and then let me die in jail in my own country? He said, Dimitri, be quiet. Get beside me. You're not allowed to speak from now on. I got beside the angel brothers. I don't know what the device was. But it travels so fast that you couldn't see anything. Wow. So he sees a light off in the distance. Looked like a car heading at him. Could that be a chariot of fire? A chariot of fire? Hmm. The same angels that came to his house and were with him in Italy. He didn't know what the device was. The device was, and it traveled so fast you couldn't see anything. So he was evidently at one point inside the thing. Wow. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that, folks. Praise Jesus. We live in an awesome, awesome universe. Hallelujah that the Father would even allow us to hear such things. Oh, I don't think that was a Freudian slip. But anyway, on that note, let's bring on Brother uh, uh, brother Kenneth. Uh, he di He was able to dial in, so praise Jesus. Brother Kenneth, are you there? I'm oh. here, Johnny. Yay! Can you... Hey, I want to yep. say something about what you just played there. You know, I, I finished up a series on Revelation, and my emphasis there, I just took a guided, I took everybody on the guided tour of heaven that the angel, one of the angels that had the seven vials before, took John on, heaven's a real place. So you're talking about things and devices, amen, you know. God created a place for us, a place, and some people say it's a planet and it's very possible, and you know what? If he's got a place for us, and he's got Ezekiel's will in the Bible, there is, like, you know, Paul said, Paul put it so well, no eye has seen, no mind, no ear has heard, no mind is conceived what God has prepared for us, but he reveals it to us through the Spirit. You know, if he just let all this stuff out, we would wither. Our little feeble, finite minds would wither. We couldn't comprehend. You know, the scripture, I think it's writer Hebrew, said that which is seen comes from that which is unseen. The unseen, the spiritual realm, is more real than this realm. And I'm not talking about in some ethereal way. I'm not talking about in some, like, smoke and mirrors way. I'm talking about real. 
And when things like that happen with Dem- Brother Dimitri, oh, wow. You know, it's real, brother. It's so real. Well, brother, and brother I am, I'll body slam your point home right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the – you just created a metaphorical baseball. Now I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a big big baseball bat and I'm gonna slam it right out of the park all the way into the next dimension. Here we go. Matthew eleven verses twelve through thirteen, Jesus spoke a mystery. He said, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent Take it by force. Let's listen to this testimony from this guy uh, known as, uh, well, he's pretty well known as a Nibiru NASA insider. Uh, but uh, anyway, listen to this. Well, you guys want to hear one that's scary? As I mm. understand, they have located the home world for God himself out in space. And, uh, and uh, this may seem like it's really over the top, but as I understand, they are planning to invade it. And so the war in heaven that you've read about entirely may happen because what I've been told is they've located the world where God lives. And uh, anybody that doesn't think there's a God out there that thinks the Bible's a comic book or whatever, don't pay any attention to what I'm saying. But the people that do believe what I'm saying... Uh, there's an entire possibility that uh, there may be a war in heaven because there's these Illuminati people that I've talked to say that uh, they have located the planet that God has lived on since day one, and there's an entire galaxy, solar systems of planets where everybody that goes to heaven lives. And apparently they're a pretty nice place, but they are planning to uh, take a raiding party to that planet and try and take over. Hey, Kenneth, what's all that weird noise in the background? Oh, you could hear that. I thought I was muted. No, what were you doing, man? It sounded like you were killing a cat. Oh, it was I, like, oh I'm so... <laughs> I thought I was muted. Oh, folks, that was a grinder. I was grinding. Oh no! Uh, oh no! Thank God you you you. It was coming from your phone because people would be saying things like, "There were demons on that radio show when that oh, Nibiru so sorry, insider folks. guy." <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hey folks, um, I I want to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all I have, but I have the responsibilities of a property to maintain, and I was doing some grinding with my my angle grinder. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Oh, I was like, what's going on here? Those sound like demons or something, screaming. <laughs> it was just me. It was me on an angle grinder, and i I heard the end of the uh, I heard the end of the clip, and I was just well, here, cutting the grinder off. We got we got time to burn. We got time to burn. I know Lauren's over there playing pinochle with those freaky dickies inside the. No, I'm kidding. In in the you know the uh, missile silo chamber or uh, uh, bunker that he has in his backyard. But here, let me. I'm gonna mute your mic and play that one more time because it's just too unbelievable. By the way, this guy goes by a handle, uh, by a nom de plume uh, as uh, Arizona, I believe, out there uh, on the in the radio world. So let's listen to this one more time. Praise Jesus. Well, you guys want to hear one that's scary? As I understand, they have located the home world for God himself out in space. And uh, and uh, this may seem like it's really over the top, but as I understand, they are planning to invade it. And so the war in heaven that you've read about entirely may happen because what I've been told is they've located the world where God lives, and uh, anybody that doesn't think there's a God out there that thinks the Bible's a comic book or whatever, don't pay any attention to what I'm saying. But the people that do believe what I'm saying, uh, there's an entire possibility that uh, there may be a war in heaven because there's these Illuminati people that I've talked to say that uh, they have located the planet that God has lived on since day one. And there's an entire galaxy, solar systems of planets where everybody that goes to heaven lives. And apparently they're a pretty nice place, but they are planning to uh, take a raiding party to that planet and try and take over. So, so and the you've got to know who their leader is. All 
All right, praise Jesus. And, and uh, of course, you're like, well, wait a minute. Isn't that limiting God? Well, not really. Because when you look at the multiple places in the Scripture in the Holy Bible where there are references where the Lord God walked upon the earth, uh, where the Lord God, um, there's the one that Kenneth quotes, and I'll bring Kenneth's mic live here in a second, but I know he's, he's doing stuff and he's busy. Um, but uh, the uh, there are just, I, I really wish I had a collection of, and I'm going to make myself a note. Yep. I am going to do that. I want to make myself a collection of every single time that our Heavenly Father came to the earth. Oh, and by the way, in the uh, testimony of Pastor uh, Jesse Duplantis, okay, and make myself a note, uh, God came to earth. Okay, now he was inside Ezekiel's wheel, we know that. He also, in uh, the book of Samuel, uh, uh, and Kenneth knows this one by heart, uh, had come down and bowed, bowed, bowed the heavens and rode on a cherubim, he flew. Uh, uh, and so there was that time. So God, God was on the cherubim uh, flying around. Okay, which, by the way, is a living creature, so that would be a, he would be flying around ultimately on a type of, a, a, if you will, a symbiotic uh, device, a cherubim created device, very similar to Ezekiel's wheel, all right, and then um, we also know that the uh, Jerusalem is the throne of God, all right, so Jerusalem is the throne of God, we, uh, there are so many references, so this concept of our Heavenly Father, uh, for whatever, I don't know, I, I can't imagine how it all works and everything, but it, it, it's it's scriptural, so we know that he it comes to the earth multiple times, many different ways, probably many different forms. Don't even get me going on the bush uh, when you know Moses in the bush and all that kind of stuff. And the Lord speaking to him, and then it was an angel, and then it was the Lord, and ah, it's just so amazing, so amazing. And um, so you know, to limit God and say that the Father doesn't go out and visit, you know, and do things at the planetary level is just kind of feeble, I think, in your in, in someone's understanding. We don't want to limit God. Okay? We don't want to limit our Father ever. Praise Jesus. Because it's just folly. It's just crazy. Um, we have to accept that he can do anything he wants to because he created all these things. This is his movie for his pleasure. They are and were created. Revelation 4.11. It's very, very exciting. Let me bring Brother Kenneth's mic live again. I bet you right now, by this time, uh, Lauren's probably standing on his table going, "Let turn on my mic! Turn on my mic! <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, are you still there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Hey, I just want to say this. Uh, we had uh, Brother Jim on, and we lost part of the show, and we're going to bring him back. But he's the one that got me thinking about, like, when King David was praising the Lord for the victory over the Assyrians. It was in Second Samuel, I think it was 20. And he, he's given this incredible praise to the Father, which it's all about, his glory. And he said, you bowed the heavens, you appeared on a chariot with fire. And, and Brother Wilhelmson got me thinking, wow, that's some kind of technology. He's going through some kind of wormhole. He's doing some kind of bending of the time-space continuum there when he bowed the heavens. And, you know, what we do is we stand in awe when we look at science and technology because we have a Hubble telescope, and we can realize now how huge this known universe is. And we, we get, like, we stand in awe when we see, like, our sun is, like, so small compared to some of these giant ones. There's one that's called um, Betelgeuse. It's like you could put, like, a billion of our suns in it, and that's not even the biggest sun. And we yeah, have to Sirius remember. Sirius is big. But, Sirius is big. Yeah, Huge. yeah. And, and what we forget, what we forget is that Jesus literally, like, opened his mouth, and by fiat, that means by command, he just said, let there be. And there was. That wasn't even work for Jesus. The work was on the cross. The work was doing what he did in that redemptive act for our salvation. He just spoke it, and it was. And look how and so look we, how real it was to Jesus. So so you yeah. take look at the two different flip sides of the coin that you just spoke, yeah. Kenneth. One side of the coin, you have an all powerful God who wants to be our friend. That we're going to be co heirs rulers and reigners with him in the universes, uh, plural, and dimensions, plural, okay? Uh, and then on the flip side of that coin, the Garden of Gethsemane, where he's in a host body of a man, and he's he's praying, he's crying out to God where the blood vessels on the side of his forehead or whatnot are, are bleeding out blood. He is 
absolutely in mental anguish and agony, suffering mentally in anticipation of the suffering that he will have to face physically. And then he's hanging on the cross in the man host body, okay, and he says at the very end, he goes, Eli, Eli, uh, uh, Lama Sabachthani, oh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is God in the flesh, folks. That just Amen. goes to show you how limiting being trapped in these awful bodies is. No wonder the uh, the third of the angels that fell with Lucifer rejected the Psalms 82 um, uh, uh, judgment. Oh my gosh, because if Jesus suffered like that, then our, then our suffering... And, and you know something else that that proves, Kenneth? Jesus is suffering in Gethsemane? Suffering, mm -hmm. suffering in Gethsemane proves that we can be fellow sufferers with Jesus, Metacoy, by mental suffering as well as physical. Oh, amen. Jesus. It, Johnny, it's so deep and big. So I just wanted to conclude this thought with, if we can stand in awe of science and technology and what it's revealed to us, we have to just remember that it's just catching a glimpse of one of the glories, of the multitude glories and majesty of, of our King and Savior Jesus. So he's above all that yet. Yet we go to our churches on Sunday and we put religion in this little box and we think, oh, that's nice. You know, it's for old ladies and little school children at Sunday school class. Oh, if we could just grasp the imminent, the, the, like the immense, and we'll, you know, awe, awe is the right word. If we could just put the awe where it belongs, not in science and technology, but at the very feet of Jesus. Oh, wow, what we could do in terms yes. of just understanding if we could shed the skin of of the of the uh of the reptile from our yep. DNA and stop being little bitty Pharisees running around pointing to everything thinking we know something right which that's really what it is everybody goes to church they listen to somebody say something they draw a little line in the sand they cube themselves into this little Maxwell smart cone of silence they become these miniature versions of Pharisees their hearts are still dirty their their spirits and their flesh is still filthy second Corinthians 7 1 they haven't sanctified themselves they don't have the love of Jesus at all and then they run around and call people names and, and it's like Amen. whoa man Narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way. Hello? Hello? What was Anybody that home? What was that young... Anybody home, McFly? <laughs> what, what was that young dude, that young... What was that young minister from uh, Bethel Church out in California who got that chastised by the senior What was his pastor? name? Yeah. yeah. Hey, come on, folks. The Lord will reveal these things to different people. He reveals things to Johnny that he doesn't reveal to me, and he reveals stuff to Ezekiel who wrote about the wheel that he didn't reveal to us. And oh, come on, this is Jesus we're talking about. It's all God. It's all God. The second we try to define a line and say, that's science, therefore it can't be of God. I'm like, since when? <laughs> Why? Made... What? Everything is God. How can you do there, that? How can you say that? There are, there are no laws of nature and laws of science. Only the laws of God that science and nature must obey. And then when God does a miracle and people don't understand this, it's not that he's breaking a law. It's that he's just superseding it or suspending it because yes. he can, yes. because he's God. Yes, yes, I cry sometimes, Kenneth. I really do. I mean, I, well, I cry all the time. I'm a big sobbing baby. But, I, but I, I, sometimes I just sit in my chair when I'm in prayer and I, I sob when I'm talking to the Lord, because I see His glory, I see the mountains, I see the birds, the hummingbirds, the even the insects, all of His glory, the flowers, the beauty of His creation, and I feel so bad, because how can anybody not see our Heavenly Father in all the beauty that's around us? And then I feel sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry, Father. I'm sorry they don't see your beauty. I'm really sorry that they don't see your beauty. I can't believe that they don't see your beauty. And then I realize he loves me. Yep. He wants me to be a part of his creation. A big part. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, it anybody who can realize that and not just break into tears it doesn't get it. Ah, so exciting. 
Anyway, uh, we got to bring on Brother Peterson. So uh, on that note, uh, praise Jesus. Uh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. There, I'm just dealing with a couple of minor changes in the... Uh, okay, here we go. All right. Praise God. The opinions of our guests are not necessarily those of Tribulation Now. TribulationNow.org, TribulationNow.net, TribulationNow.com, Facebook.com, or slash TribulationNow. Or for that matter, ah, heck, they may not be anyone else's opinions. What? So, be a good Berean, X1711, and search the scriptures daily to see if it is so. May God bless you. Brother Lauren, are you there? I'm here. I'm still hanging in there. <laughs> still hanging oh, in here. Still hanging. You covered in a here. lot of your favorite subjects. Yeah, I want to just jump right in, you know. Many, <laughs> but it was really, really great listening to everything. You know, get get got me fired up, you know. Ah, oh, praise God. <laughs> you know, well, I'm pulling uh, your string now. Ready to get pulling my string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember those dolls back in the seventies? You pull their string and they're like talking to you. Now they can't they can't sell them anymore because of those Chucky movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Chucky movies. <laughs> no, they can't sell them anymore. Oh no. <laughs> oh wow. Um, <clears throat> yeah, wow. <clears throat> so, you know, you get up in the morning. Uh, with a two-hour lead time, like for me, it's five o'clock, you know, and I think I got two hours before show time to do some prep work and pray and stuff, and before you know it, that two hours is gone. It's like where'd it go? You know, that two hours is like two minutes. <laughs> okay, maybe I needed twenty hours. Out of twenty hours, I'd get what would feel like two hours of actual <laughs> time. You know, uh, this time compression, time expansion uh, dynamic. <clears throat> that we live in. Okay, uh, in talking about time compression, I want to touch on that before we get into some other things because I've been reading recently through um, Genesis, um, you know, like through the 9 and 10, you know, onwards, and now I'm into uh, Jacob, his 12 sons, and currently I'm, I've just been reading through ch chapters like 36 through 38, uh, 38 deals with uh, the one of the brothers. His name was Judah. Okay, so I'll read. Uh, I think the first six verses out of Genesis chapter 38 <clears throat> to deal with the time compression problem. Okay, and it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned into a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, that's the name of the Canaanite guy, and he took her and went in unto her. And she conceived the bore a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bore a son, and she, she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bore a son and called his name Shelah. And he was at Shezib when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. All right, the first six verses of Genesis chapter 8. Some serious time compression issues here. <clears throat> so, how long did that take me? Maybe 30 seconds at most to read through all that? Maybe less, 20 seconds? Then eating by, you want want me to read through it again and put me on a time watch? Okay. Okay, so, the you know, there's certain people that read this. I, I've encountered these Christians, okay, that if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist. If it's not in the Bible, they're not going to believe it. Okay. And whatever is in the Bible, that's what they believe. Okay, so here we have this daughter of a Canaanite that Judah goes in unto, and she has a, 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 her firstborn named Ur, and then the next verse, she conceives again and bears a son and calls his name Onan in the split second it takes 
to read that verse. And then a third son. I mean, pop, pop, pop. In a matter of about three seconds, she has three sons fully grown. Isn't that wonderful how God works? <laughs> okay. Now, a reasonable person would realize, okay, on the first son, uh, she bore, uh, bears the son, okay? Well, you know what? Unless these were triplets, they didn't come out at the same time time frame, okay? So the way this reads to me, they, these three boys were not triplets. They came out at later times. It's conceivable that maybe 10 to 12 months apart for each one. I have no idea. You might have to go to other records, um, like Jewish records that go back. Whoever has these ancient records that goes into this level of detail on just exactly what the time frame was. I have no idea. Maybe someone does. But it's reasonable to assume that these three boys were not triplets, that they came out of her womb at separate times apart from each other. And then in verse 6, and Judah took a wife for Ur's firstborn. Okay, well, how old was Ur? Had he just popped out of the, out of the uh, womb, and now he's ready for, for marriage to Tamar? Okay. It's reasonable to assume that, that he was at least in his, I would say, in his late teens, maybe early 20s, maybe later. Sometimes in the Old Testament, a man would not get married until he was like 40 or something, or 35. So we don't have, from this account, we don't have any indication on how old Ur was when he married Tamar. But for those people who believe, well, it's not the Bible, I don't believe it. Okay, well, anywhere from, let's say, 18 years to 40 years have transpired for Ur that nothing is mentioned about in the Bible. So I guess that... 18 to 40 years never happened anywhere in creation, right? Nowhere. Nowhere else on the planet, nowhere else in all of creation did that 18 to 40 years happen. The moment that that uh, this Canaanite wife of Judah popped her out of her womb, he was fully grown, fully ready to get married right away to Tamar. That's how ridiculous some people get in their understanding of the Bible. So ridiculous they can finally under, maybe understand why the world thinks Christians are a bunch of nutcases that don't understand anything about reality. When you sit there and say, if it's not in the Bible, I don't believe it. Well, 18 to 40 years went by here. Um, that's Nothing's mentioned in the Bible on, on anything, okay? So I guess the time, either it did happen or it did not happen, okay? So according to these... Um, certain Christians, that time never happened. Okay, never happened at all. That all these three boys popped out of the womb, fully grown men, ready to be married. Isn't that great? <laughs> okay, a reasonable person would understand that each took about nine months to come out of her womb, and some time went before she had another, became impregnated again, you know, up to three times. At a certain time frames are going by here. And in neither of these sons, none of these sons, is it mentioned what time frame when they got old enough to be married. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to bring that up on how, how we condense time down into little 12-ounce pop cans, and we just, just like this creation, there's still people today who believe that creation happened in six literal 24-hour days, period. And that all of creation is no more than 6,000 years old, period. Talk about a serious time compression problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so right here, I'm pointing out right here is a very clear-cut case where time went by, but nothing else is mentioned in the Bible during that time. So did that time happen? Were there other things going on, other people being born in the world, other events going on, wars, famines, droughts, floods, plagues throughout the earth during this time that the Bible's talking about three, three boys? 
Was anything else going on out there in the universe? Was the sun even shining in this missing 18 to 40 years? <laughs> okay. Uh, is the sun shining if there's no one to observe it, its light, its frequencies? <laughs> okay. It's like, did a tree? does a tree fall and create a sound if there's nobody there to hear it? That kind of enigma, okay. So... <clears throat> I bring that up because there's a lot of things in the Bible that that reflect this time compression problem. You can even go back to um, the story of Eve when she begat Cain and begat um, Abel. That if you just read that on a surface, it sounds like pop, pop. They came out one right after the other, and that there was they came out as full grown men. Okay, well, that would be uh, kind of ridiculous to uh, assume that or to believe that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so and there's other examples throughout the Bible of time compression. Um, so I wanted to just touch on that. Any comments so far? Any comments? No. Do I need no. any Run with the ball, brother. Run with the ball. Any I even got... Can, I got no, no, Rotten not, tomatoes. No, no, don't you dare say that there's <laughs> angels that use technologies, or I'm going to jump through it, this phone and. <laughs> you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah Kenneth, me? go ahead. There is a guy, and I cannot find him. If I do, I'll bring it up on a later show. He was talking specifically about what you were talking about there, Lauren. Not, not like with the Bible, but with this uh, elasticity or compressibility of time, and. He had a really good theory on it. If I can dig it up, we can bring it up on a future show. But sure. he was showing how this happens through cycles or ages. And, you know, sometimes people say tempest fugit, you know, time flies. Well, maybe literally it does, like you said this morning. Those two hours felt like two minutes. And, you know, like uh, Peter tells us, like uh, uh, a day for the Lord is like a thousand years. Well, this is this wasn't a Christian that came up with this theory. He was, I think, he was a physicist. So if I can find it, and then this falls right along with Einstein's theories on uh, general and you know specific relativity. But I'll have to see if I can dig that up, and I'll get it over to you. You bet. That sounds great. Okay, now um, <sighs> it's one of those times when there's so much, so many th different things to talk about. It's like, where do you start? You know, and I know we're talking about the um, Syrians. Okay, so um, on the Serious Rock Connections web page from the website called SyrianRevelations.net, uh, it talks about the Dogons of Africa, and and you know I've mentioned before them before a little bit, and you've mentioned them before on Tribulation now. Uh, radio shows and stuff, uh, the Dogons of Africa. So on this site it says that the Syrians had already contacted them 5,000 years ago. Now what I'm going to do here is throw out an enigma, a question mark, to our traditional view of things. Okay, so the Dogons of Africa, according to the Syrians, had been, already been contacted 5,000 years ago. If we go back 2,000, we're at, at the, the B.C., B.C. 80 crossover. So this would take us 3,000 years ago, 3,000 B.C. So at some point, 3,000 B.C., give or take, is when the Dogons of Africa were already there. They just didn't, presto changeo, wave the magic wand. Now there's a full-blown civilization of Dogons in Africa. Okay, So it takes time to develop tribe, the civilization of these Dogons in Africa. They just didn't appear out of the blue, okay, 3,000 years ago. So wh who were they, what were they, what happened in the lead up to this 3,000 B.C., okay? So according to the traditional theory of Adam and Eve, uh, mankind being created at 4,000 B.C., uh, that would mean that 1,000 years went by, before the Dogons appeared on the scene in Africa. So already there was an Africa. This would place the Dogons in the pre-flood world. Now you see the problem here, folks? How do you get Dogons in Africa in the pre-flood world 
and you get Dogons in Africa in the post-flood world, in the post-Tower of Babel world, into our time. Even. I, wait, wait, wait. I know the answer. It's in one <laughs> of the episodes of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, how did the Dogons, if this is... if if the 4000 BC is the true entry point for Adam and Eve, how did the Dogons get from a, from the pre-flood world to the post-flood world if they were not on the ark? Because according to the Bible, only those on the ark were saved from that flood. Did the Dogons in the pre-flood dig into the ground? Did they were they part of the the um, the world at that time that dug deep in the earth, uh, you know, deep underground <laughs> shelters like we're doing today, and they just simply emerged on the other side of the flood, came out of their underground shelters. I suppose some people might explain it that way. But what I'm alluding to here is this time compression problem, and I'm going to leave it at that. Not only do we have a problem of God creating everything only 6,000 years ago, but I have a problem believing that God created mankind 6,000 years ago. And I know that gets into the, the, um, the lineages as in like Genesis chapter 10 of who begot who begot who. But what if our understanding of the time frames of those lineages is way off? What if we're missing key, a key that would unlock the true time frame? the true lineages. When the Bible says that, that so-and-so begat so-so, that begat so-and-so, I can show you right in black and white where that's not necessarily the case. In our way of thinking, when we, we look at our own families, and we can say that, you know, John, you begat so-and-so. I don't remember how many children you have, but I know you have a daughter, right? Um. I don't know if you have a son or not, but, you know, you, be, you begat so-and-so, okay? So that's a direct connect lineage, direct father-daughter, okay? Well, what does this have to do with the doggone dogons? <laughs> doggone dogons. <laughs> <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I couldn't read that. I, I couldn't read that. Okay. okay, so when, the, when, when, uh, when Jesus was talking uh, to some of the scribes and Pharisees at various times, and the one that's, uh, I, may, I forget where it was in, John chapter 10 or something, but he's talking to the scribes and Pharisees, and they're telling him that we are of our father Abraham. Okay? Well, did Abraham, now in our, our understanding of things, we know that Abraham did not directly, physically begat those scribes and Pharisees. <laughs> okay? Abraham is like, what, 3,000 at the same time, supposedly these dog on dog, dogons came on the scene. Um, okay, uh, when did Abraham come on the scene? Okay, so <clears throat> you know, like several thousand, uh, a few, I don't know how many hundreds of years prior. I haven't looked it up. I haven't done the calculations. But in other words, there is no way that Abraham could be the direct father of those scribes and Pharisees, and yet they're claiming that he was their father, okay? That gives us a clue that not necessarily when the Bible says so-and-so begat so-so, that begat so-so, is that a direct father-son relationship. It, there could be generations that have gone by in between time, is what I'm saying. And there is reference in black and white to that enigma that I have read in reading these early Genesis accounts that's like, whoa, man, <laughs> whoa. You see, when peop people, at, uh, if you remember like the run of the 2012 and there's other points, el and all this, that various Christians were deep diving into these super calculations. I mean, you have to admire their their technical prowess at mathematics and digging into the Bible and what means what, what means this and that, and coming up with all these calculations. But I had in my back of my mind that they would be wrong, and they were wrong because their premise is wrong. You can't come up with a correct conclusion if your 
beginning argument is off, okay? And so our understanding, my opinion, folks, get out the pitchforks, get out the rotten tomatoes, is our understanding of the timeline has been way off because we have only looked at it from a direct who begat who rather than understanding that entire generations could have passed by in between who begat who. Just like when I read here about uh, Judah having these three sons, we, if it doesn't, if the Bible doesn't say it, I don't believe it. Okay. Well, 18 to 40 years go by, the Bible isn't talking about anything else in that time frame. So I guess nothing else happened in, in that time. In fact, that 18 40 years, those three boys popped out of that woman's uh, womb, fully developed men, ready to be married. Okay. How ridiculous do we want to get, okay? And when you think of um, the idea that the earth is a young earth made to look old, okay? So granted, you could build a brand new house, but you could build it to look like it was a 19... uh, 20s house or 30s house or you could build it to look like a 1776 house you know and you could go get some actual you know let's say a a a house from the 1700s finally has to be torn down it's beyond repair unfortunately and you go grab the the lumber the timbers the the all the different wood from that house that you can salvage to build your brand new house to look like a 1700s house and you're using the actual wood from, you know, two, three hundred years ago to give it that ambiance, that feel that even though this is a brand new house, it has that feel of history to it. You can just feel it in the very wood. You can touch the wood. You can touch the doors. You can look at all the trim, window trims, the floor trims, the the wood planks themselves and the floors knowing that people for two, three hundred years have walked on that wood, have lived in in that, you know, have left their imprint. You can feel it if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. Okay, so you could say, okay, well, God created everything with the appearance of age. But what we're talking about here in Chronicles is the opposite, is that the earth is an old earth, renovated to look new. Just like a house that's been partially burned, and okay, it's not totally burned, so it's salvageable. You can go in, you can renovate it, you can clean it up, and make it look like nothing ever happened to it. And go right back into living in it. Now, that would be called the fallen one-third. The problem with the fallen one-third is it cannot yet be placed, can be yet be recreated to be like it was before the Luciferian Rebellion and the Angel Wars. Because what that did was cause a phase shift away from the original frequencies of the original creation. Those frequencies are what we live in, an altered reality that God had to restore, he had to renovate it, but he could not yet bring it back to perfection because you have to deal with this sin issue, this altered frequency issue. Okay, so that reflects into our DNA. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it diminished ever so slightly their DNA, body, soul, spirit. It directly impacted their spiritual DNA that part of their DNA that dealt with the spiritual component was directly impacted, directly diminished, cut off, the immediate cut off from the Holy Spirit. So they did not die in the flesh right away. So they thought, well, maybe uh, the serpent was correct, that surely will not die. So death did not come right away. Spiritual death, yes, but in their now in their carnal thinking, is what they had left, and that was still very powerful because they still had 90-plus percent of their soul realm and flesh realm to live very powerful lives in those two spheres, okay? 
so that just that in itself was able to extend their lives to 900 plus years old. Okay, so um, as we go move through and you know, look at Noah's flood, a global catastrophe, a nearly 50 percent drop off in mankind's DNA and activation. Okay, after the Tower of Babel in my opinion, world cataclysmic event, another nearly 50% drop-off in mankind's age and his DNA activation. Okay. Now, the Bible clearly points out <clears throat> that mankind's age has dropped. That's, that's what gave me the first clue back in 74, 75, because I already knew uh, I was raised in the church. I had a fairly good foundation of the Bible stories, I was a, a no expert by any means, but I had a good foundation uh, of things, you know. So when I was reading these books in 75, that some of them tapped back into, like this first one I read, Colony Earth, by Richard E. Mooney, that tapped into the Tower of Babel story and tapped into Atlantis, tapped into the possibility of mankind had, had much better DNA back at some point in the past, better DNA, better, more activation, perfect memory recall, kind of powers that today would would we would think they were gods you know back then but they were just you know human beings back then but they they all okay so if everybody in the planet today had a 50 percent activation in their dna we would just think that was normal but if somebody today shows up you know we're at the eight percent give or take you know but maybe some people at the top are like at 10 percent you know in the world today you could say, okay, so if somebody were to show up on the scene today at 20%, 30%, 50% activation of their DNA, we would think they were gods, okay? They would just be able to do superhuman feats. And this, oh, I forget, there's a show, come, a TV show that's coming up this fall. Um, rats, I forgot the name of it, but it's about tapping in, you know, un- unleashing our or that potential that's within us to do superhuman feats. I forget the name of it, too. <clears throat> Rats. Um, I know which one you're talking about. What? Which one? Doggone it. It, it, it. It's it's about this. Are you talking about the one where the guy is, the, he takes a pill? Yeah. And it's, yeah, like, it's like a, it's in the shape of a disc, and it's kind of clear, the pill. And yeah. um, I just saw the previews for that. Yeah, me just too. Just last night. And um, yeah, and, and there's a movie. There's a movie that was out about that. There was another. Oh, I can't remember the name of the movie either. But there was a movie where where they had this pill that got released by this pharmaceutical company or something. And the guy, you had to t- retake the pill over and over again. But he got super. You got superhuman. Anyway, we can get off on a tangent on this. But yes, you were right. Yeah. There is a yeah. a new episode or series of TV shows coming out based on that pre- that premise. Yep. And he gets like full activation or whatever, and he's like, and he saves his his father's life because he could see stuff and new stuff that even the doctors couldn't figure out. And, yeah. Sure. So so imagine having that kind of capability. We we would think we had arrived at the pro, you know the golden age of the you know <clears throat> the the paradise. We would think we had arrived at paradise lost. You know that was lost long ago. We've arrived back at there to regain these lost abilities, these lost powers. And that's one of the things that these Syrians are dangling in front of us <clears throat> is uh, to recapture the, the ascension of the human race, you know, to, to reactivate our DNA that been, has been deactivated for a long, long time. Okay. So, again, uh, just a quick, here is the Dogons of Africa that already existed 5,000 years ago. Okay. And they didn't appear out of nowhere. But through traditional church teaching, that would place them um, about 1,000 years after Adam and Eve. All right? Now, the Dogons still are in existence in Africa today. So uh, either the Bible is telling us the truth about Noah and his family being the only people on the earth that escaped, or did the Dogons dig into the earth and underground, went into underground chambers, and came out the backside of the flood? Okay, some people might believe that. Or is our timeline off? <laughs> and the Dogons are actually post-Tower of Babel tribe. Okay, I'll just throw that out there as an interesting tidbit. 
<laughs> if you want to throw rotten tomatoes <laughs> or lemons at me, that's fine. Um, okay, so we wonder how, um, why in the world is Earth such a strategic, it seems to be a strategic planet. Everybody's interested in this planet. Everybody wants to go to war over this planet. What in the world is it with this planet that's such a high-stakes game of poker? And I'm not trying to diminish it by calling a high-stakes game of poker. It's, it's a winner-take-all situation. So it's, it is very serious. But it's this back and forth. What's so important about this planet? It's just a speck, and a small speck in this. Something else. Something else yeah. to think about. Remember when yeah. the father remember when yeah. the father said he repented for having created man on That's this right. planet or, or right. so, I, I think I had yeah. that right. And I, yeah. something like that. And he said and that he actually if the father was second guessing his decision to put 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 us the Psalms 82 judged man and woman, you know, yeah. put us on here, on this planet. If he was second-guessing his choice to put us here on this planet, then... Cons- Kenneth, 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 here, I, let, me, let me mute his mic. Hold on a second. He's out there digging a trench and bringing us... <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, uh, he's, yeah, last, last time I heard he was halfway to China, and he's upsetting the Yellowstone National Park situation. But anyway... <laughs> oh, that's him, huh? Okay. <laughs> it's him, doggone it. It's been him all along, them darn chickens. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, but, but why, if the father was... So let's, let's just take, take this into consideration for a second. Yep. Heavenly Father decides to put uh, mankind, ultimately, uh, in their fallen state to go through their reconciliation process to to serve their sentence in their judgment. Ultimately, Jesus comes down and, and makes that possible through his blood and suffering. Praise God. Um, but but the Father's like looking at Earth and he's kind of like going, oh man, this, was, this wasn't a good decision. Things are really bad. Uh, it gets a lot worse than I thought. I'm going to have to destroy it with a flood. Oh my gosh, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like kind of like makes you wonder then if if there are other places he might have stuck us that maybe were less infested with the otherworldly being creature fallen angelic phenomenon problem. Yeah, it makes you wonder. Because we, we assume we assume that God you know, God knows the beginning from the end. So could he not have foreseen the difficulties that would that mankind would have encountered to the point where you end up only with Noah? Okay. That that God repented, that He was, you know, second guessing His decision to put mankind on this planet. Okay, so <clears throat> I view I view our Father as an interactive God. He interacts with His creation. If if you absolutely know the beginning from the end, would would mean that you're an absolute dictator, and that everything and everybody else is nothing but a puppet on a string that there really is no free will. We're just going through what we perceive as free will, and we're just uh, actors and actresses in a play that's already been scripted and already been decided on, and, and the last chapter in the book has already been written, and there's no hope for anybody. Okay? No hope for anybody. <laughs> the world ends, we all get blown up, <laughs> and everybody goes to hell. But that's not what the good news tells us about Jesus and why he came. And then wh- the question is, why did he come? to redeem that which is lost, and to defeat what what the enemy has done, to defeat the works of the enemy, the works of darkness, to defeat it. Now, <clears throat> you know, it's not God's fault that mankind went, you know, he, he gave us free will. We've got to believe that. Free will, he gave creation a free will. Even the sun that's shining its sunlight on this earth, our earth here, in a, in a, a very broad cosmic sense, has a free will. Okay, we may not perceive our sun as a living being, or perceive this earth as a living being, but our Father is the Father of all life. And so, as He would have created the original creation, 
whether it be stars, planets, galaxies, right down to amoebas, <laughs> okay, uh, he would have put his life into whatever he created. Life. So those planets floating out there in space are not just dead rocks floating around a, a star that's a dead star, you know. It's life. It's an entire creation of different manifestations of our Father's expression of his life. Well, well the, you know what else supports that? Why would Jesus what? have said, I suppose even the rocks would cry exactly. out? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And that's what the New Agers have been telling us all this time, is that this earth, Gaia, okay, is alive. That the sun is a living being. That these very rocks, you know, New Agers that go out and find their rock, they communicate with their rock. Well, that rock is telling them something. There are certain people that can connect with rocks, that can connect with trees, that can connect with horses and dogs and cats, okay? <laughs> oh, that's of the devil. Well, then you go ahead and tell your pet cat, your pet dog, that they're of the devil, and you're going to get rid of them, okay? <laughs> uh, that would be Looney Tunes, right? And yet we think that people that can connect with rocks or trees, they're Looney Tunes. Well, maybe the people, you know, you can go back and forth. God put his signature on everything he created. When, when he spoke into existence, he put his, initially, in the original creation, he spoke forth the rhema word into creation. The living word. Okay? Into everything that was created. So that rock, you can see, think that rock is not alive, not as we know it. Remember, there was, a, I think, a couple Star Trek episodes, original Star Trek, that dealt with, uh, one was the Horta. It was a silicon-based life form that lived deep in the, the bowels of the planet, and it could just burrow through ro solid rock, And but yet it was a silicon-based life form. Then there was another episode that was a silicon-based life form. So it would, when it... It would just appear as a normal rock. You know, you could take a sledgehammer to it, <clears throat> or that kind of thing, or a phaser. But it would come to life and talk, and then would return back to its rock form. Okay. <clears throat> I think, was that the the uh, reptilian where Kirk had a face-off with the reptilian? Was that the episode? Um, anybody uh, know, you know, let me or John know if you remember that one. <clears throat> I, but what, uh, what, I'm not sure. I'm trying to. Right, wait Gorn, a minute. The, you know wait a minute. Hold on. Guy? Line three. Line three. Let me see what's going on here. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. Something going on. <laughs> <laughs> There's something going on over there. I don't know. There's something going on out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> No, there's definitely <laughs> something going on out there. It doesn't sound good. I, you okay. know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> so, so what? <laughs> so what if there's some life forms out there, out there, life forms that are silicon based, and to our perception, they may just appear as just being ordinary rocks, okay? But from their perception, maybe they, how do they perceive us if we were to go to their planet? You know, here's all these rocks. Uh, okay, we well, just think they're rocks, but they're actually a life form from their perspective, you know, the way they were created. And how do, how would they perceive us? Would they perceive us as an alien virus, you know, out to destroy their, their civilization? <laughs> if we come with our sledgehammers and our phasers and our lasers and everything, we're going to mine these rocks, and they fight back or something, you know. We have rocks versus humans kind of thing, you know, kind of something weird, you know. But <clears throat> you don't know. Uh like Howard Howard Storm, Pastor Howard Storm, that Jesus showed him some of these life forms and he was correct me if I'm wrong, if I remember correctly, John, he was freaked out by what he saw. Or was it somebody oh, he else? Said, he said he said a whole bunch of them actually it's fascinating because it aligns perfectly with the testimonies of um uh oh golly, golly, I'm just <sighs> Sergeant now, been there's yep. so many of them. All the, the testimonies that were brought forward by um, the Disclosure Project and and Dr. Uh, Greer, 
Stephen yeah. Greer. Yeah. Uh, he did that whole deal where I've got three DVD, a three DVD set of testimonies of ex-military personnel, uh, including uh, Clifford Stone. That's who I was thinking of. All these testimonies basically say the same thing: the people who have been down in the Dulce underground bases, uh, and 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 the hall hallway, what they call the hallway of horrors. Okay, mm. they've got evidently a whole uh, golly. Uh, bunch of different kinds of species of beings that that have been captured from spacecraft um from and this testimony is from a whole bunch of different people um uh you know un saying the same thing and and uh they some of them look like i don't know octopuses and all kinds of creepy weird strange life forms and they've got them locked up you know and uh Almost like Star Trek, you know, with that whole force field thing going on. You know how they would throw them inside the uh, the special room and and the uh, I don't know. I don't know if they're using bars. I, I would imagine they have to have some pretty highly advanced containment systems for some of these beings down there in Dulce. I don't know. Yeah, quite. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> you bet. Um. <clears throat> So the possibility of all these different life forms on, on different planets, different situations that our Heavenly Father created. <clears throat> and that's not to, to even say that after the angel wars and, and uh, some of these creator gods, okay, some of these creator gods fell with Lucifer. Not all of them, but some of them. Okay, So they would have brought their technologies with them, right? They would have brought their life creation technologies with them. And so Lucifer and all these fallen one-third were cut off from the rhema word, just like when Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit. The moment they partook, they were cut off from the rhema word because they were cut off from the Holy Spirit. They immediately lost their light body, their light body capabilities, and were immediately locked into a flesh body. <clears throat> okay, So picture this fallen one-third of the angelics, what we call angelics, but I, I just say, well, angelics to uh, kind of generally understand, you know, what most people are familiar with, angels, <clears throat> angelics. To me, angelics in encompasses more than just angels. So like you were saying at the beginning of the show about the angel that appeared to Daniel, okay, was different in, in, in appearance and composition than the angels that appeared unto Abraham. Okay, so we have a, a range of angelics. Now, the well, here's one, the other thing. Lauren, yeah, here's the other thing ahead. to toss out there, because this is a question that hit me a thousand times. Because, okay, for example, they have, yeah. I forget what the name of the statue is, but they dug it up in the land of Ur, where Job was born and raised and lived yeah. with his family. Uh, the land of Ur, which is in the Mesopotamian Valley over in Iraq, and they dug, they dug up this little figurine, a statue, is hand-carved, of a reptilian creature uh, being, and it has a baby reptilian in its yeah. hand. Yeah. Now I, I and I, I I'm like what? And then of course you have the testimony of Phil Schneider, and when yeah. he was lowered down into the, uh, the 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 tunnel that was bored straight down into the earth because they were boring out or demolishing, you know, boom boom boom, you know, blowing out the the rock so that they could build the Dulce underground bases. So there's this 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 he was being lowered down into this shaft. That they created to, to, and when and he ran across these tall grays, and he had a Walt, he even said I had a Walter Walter PPK uh, sidearm. Uh, he was also surrounded, and there were a lot of uh, black ops personnel involved. Of course, of course they'd be there, and um, he uh, got into a. They call it the Dulce Wars. He got into a gunfight, sure. lost a couple of his fingers, <clears throat> got shot, a laser beam was shot at him, uh, yeah. uh, and and he was and he even said about how bad they smelled. You know, they had this horrible, sickening, metallic, horrible, icky. And these were the tall grays. These weren't the little four foot ones. And he killed them. He so. so you could kill them. So you got the, the statue with the reptilian. With The reptilians are phenomenally expert at keeping hidden. Uh, yep. I, I they have some some powers to shape shift and stuff that they've been able to maintain even after they became in a fallen state. Um, sure. But, but, but when you, um, what's up with the babies? How come the tall grays 
uh, if you want to learn about the tall grays, you'd want to search on Charles Hall. Charles Hall. There's some excellent articles that he wrote about his encounters with the tall grays. Uh, and I think it was ne ne Nell's Air Force Base or Nelly or Nell's. N e l l is the first part of it. But that air, I believe it was that Air Force Base. He spent uh, a greater part of his entire career there as a type of a custodian in a part of the base that was segmented off from the rest. Uh, for the purpose of allowing the tall whites to come down, land their craft, do maintenance operations, and then take back off again. And, uh, and, and they had families. They had kids and everything. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, you know, I'm like, okay. And I've had conversations with Zen Garcia about this because, you know, he's, he's pretty up on this kind of stuff. Well, he, he's advanced in his thinking, no doubt. And, um, uh, uh, and, the only thing we can figure is that when the fall occurred, which was millions, if not maybe even billions of years ago, uh, the, the ultimately the judgment came down, the curse came down uh, from the Father, uh, and millions of many, 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 many life forms were uh, I involved in, in, and now were cursed and in a fallen state, but they continued to procreate. Generations and generations of them continued to be born over millions of years of time, and some of them got trapped, you know, when the Anunnaki 400,000 years ago came down, you know, arguably from Nibiru in one of its cycles. Uh, you know, they had come down here on spaceships, uh, ultimately, and uh, 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 and 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 started to do all that m monkeying around with with the DNA of Neanderthal man and Cro-Magnon man and all that kind of stuff to create themselves a workforce. Uh, and then when they took off, when they said, "Oh, we're out of here," because there was they had an encounter with these. Uh, I'm not going to get into that; it's a whole other thing. But when they left, they left behind uh, a slave workforce uh, of uh, these various reptilian beings. And and uh, who knows? Uh, are you know were they the Nagas of India were they the creatures that that were slaughtering the miners in the Chilean mine disaster uh, just a few years ago down in Chile uh, that NASA had to be involved in? Why was NASA 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 the space agency of the United States of Babylon the Great? Why were they down there cardening off the area and controlling it just like uh, one of the scenes from uh, uh, you know Close Encounters of the Third Kind for crying out loud? I mean, come on, folks, it, the, the writing's on the wall. It's unbelievably obvious. This whole angel war thing, this whole uh, fall of these beings, these races of beings and stuff, you know, when you look at all the data, holy mackerel, it is not, uh, it's not as simple as, as, as people would like to make it. It includes millions of years of time, mil bunches of different kinds of beings and, and, and stuff are all involved in this thing. Lucifer is real. Um, and the outer space is included in the dynamic. It's in scope. Uh, and there are spaceships involved. And, and like it or lump it, it you can't deny it. Praise God, thank you, Jesus. And then you have to like go, holy mackerel, how does this all fit into the grand scheme of things? Boy, folks, when the strong delusion comes, people are going to... Thank you, Jesus, I asked um, Jim Wilhelmson this question. I loved his answer. <laughs> I don't agree with everything that Jim believes in. Jim doesn't believe in everything that we believe in. Amen. Praise God. It would be in unbelievable if we all believed, and it certainly wouldn't make for interesting conversation if we all believe the same thing. But he, I said to him live on the air before the radio show blew up, I said, I said Jim, I've got to ask you this question. If a giant 15-mile-wide mothership came cruising low over the town that you were in, just like in the movie uh, uh, Independence Day, what would you say? See, what I was doing was I was kind of baiting him a little bit because I wanted to see if he was okay with the strong delusion, including 15-mile-wide motherships, or if he would just take the position, oh, that's not going to happen. And his answer was awesome. He goes, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, right on. He didn't say it like that exactly, but that was in essence what he said. I was like, oh, man, right on. God bless you, Jim. That's exactly how it's going to be, I think. Praise Jesus. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's big. It's big. It's big. It's so big, it would just stupefy most people on the planet. Yeah, there is no way they're going to be able to pull off the strong del if, if People who think that the strong delusion is ultimately going to be Obama – 
walking out onto a podium with a couple of greys under his arms. <laughs> yeah. And they think that that's the strong delusion. <laughs> if there's going to be 7 billion people laughing their butts off, no one will believe it. They will think no. it is a, a Hollywood prop. It that's has right. to be Independence Day. If it's not Independence Day, it will not convince mankind, <laughs> and men's hearts will not fail them for fear of those things coming upon the earth. Praise oh, God. That, that's true. That's very true. <laughs> okay. Okay, so... <clears throat> Oh wow! You know it's like my. Hey Kenneth, mind is... are you there? Are you still digging a hole to China? Oh, I'm here. I'm listening along. I, I wanted, uh, I wanted to, to bring your mic live because I wanted to bring your mic live because your your mute had gone unmuted there for a second, and we could hear you. We could hear the Chinaman yelling at you through the hole, going, oh, "You know, oh, chit uh, hang one hundred." You know what they told me? Huh? You know what they told me, Johnny? Warren, brother Warren. They said no ticky, no laundry. <laughs> no ticky, no laundry. I'm here for my laundry. I'm digging my bunker. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard one of them say Szechuan egg foo young. <laughs> yeah, they they were down there taking orders for lunch too. I didn't know what you guys wanted, so I didn't That's order. That's making me hungry. That's making me hungry. I'm trying to keep. I'm trying <laughs> to lose <laughs> weight, man. We can't talk about well, Chinese food. Jump, <laughs> let me jump in here and just say a big amen to everything I've been hearing you guys talk about. We get into this little mindset, and we create these sacred cows like uh, uh, Curry Blake calls them, and we think if it's not in the Bible, as, Bur- I mean, how do I word this? Like Brother Warren was saying about the three sons. You know, come on, folks. Things take time. Use common sense. Apply common sense when you read these things. And then if somebody's telling you, well, it can't be because the Bible didn't say so. Oh, really? So, so all these things just like happened in the three sentences that Brother Warren read, and there wasn't any time between them. Our God is so big. You know, it says at the end of the Gospel of John that had everything that Jesus has done been written down. Oh, I suppose all the libraries of the world could not contain it. He's so big. He's so enormous. We're just fitting the pieces of the puzzle together, crucial for salvation and righteous living as we overcome and occupy till he returns. There's so much more to this story. It's so awesome. It's so big. And I just love listening to you two guys talk. All right, Amen. Lord, you're on the spot now. That's a tough <laughs> act to follow, bro. You better have something profound to say. <laughs> hey, I think the Borg are going to assimilate. We are Borg. You will be assimilated. I am Locutus. Okay. Are hey. you Locutus, too? <laughs> hey, You're cute, ass- Locutus. <laughs> You're cute with all that machinery hooked up. <laughs> hey, Borg, assimilate this. No. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a Holy Spirit fireball coming right at you. I'm going to shoot Amen. fire out of my mouth for 1,260 days right at you. <laughs> Praise <right>. God. <laughs> Revelation 11 at you, uh, Borg. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And and their and their ships, isn't it fascinating? Their ships were cube shaped just like uh what I, I guess the New Jerusalem dimensions are, isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Makes you think, <laughs> don't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, I want to throw out another tidbit about Judah. Notice he married a Canaanite woman. Now if you look back at Abraham refused to take a wife from amongst the Canaanites for his son Isaac and sent his servant back to the home country to his own family to to find a wife for his son Isaac. Isaac likewise, uh, through a series of events we know of Jacob and Esau and um, mom, I think it was Rachel, and, you know, because Esau was so ticked off by what had happened to him from Jacob that Esau wanted to murder his brother, uh, which, which you know, kind of has reflections of Cain and Abel to it, okay? <clears throat> so Rachel uh, concocts a scheme to get Isaac to agree to it, to send jo- uh, Jacob back to the home country to find a, a wife, a suitable wife, and not from these Canaanite women. And so notice that Esau took two wives from, from the local girls, and then eventually Egyptian wife, a wife from Egypt. Okay, <clears throat> so when you get to Jacob and his 12 sons, by the time you have 12 sons, it gets more difficult just from having 12 instead of one or two to make sure that they all have, you know, girls from the hometown, <laughs> hometown girls rather than the local girls, okay? So here's Judah, <clears throat> who's one of the 12 
tribes, you know, who, who's the, the head of one of the 12 tribes, and he takes a Canaanite woman as his wife. Now, we know that Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. Okay? I hadn't factored that in, okay? I had, you know, it's like a lot of years ago I read through this, and now I'm just reading through it now, and I'm connecting some dots here. A Canaanite woman, the Canaanite bloodline is in Jesus' bloodline. Okay? So now he's talking to what's, what started this, Syrian discussion, discussion about Sirius was the Canaanites and the the, the worship the star Sirius, the dog star, dog Cain, you know Canaan Canaanites, the dog star, dog star. Okay, how it all connects. That even within his bloodline, his blood lineage was the Canaanites. And if you remember the story, Genesis chapter. Nine were Noah curses Ham's youngest son Canaan, and then chapter uh, chapter ten goes into those various lineages. Okay, so Cain Canaan was the youngest son of Ham, and he's the one that Noah cursed. So you can see why Abraham did not want to choose a Canaanite woman for his son Isaac, and likewise why. Then Rachel decided, I don't want, you know, here's Esau who took two wives from the local girls. And Rachel decided, I don't want Jacob. He hadn't taken a wife yet, so I don't want him to take a wife from these local girls. I'm going to send him home to the home, to the kinfolk back home, and get a wife from there. <clears throat> um, or is that Rebecca? I'm sorry. I get the two ladies mixed up, um, <laughs> Rebecca and Rachel. Okay, so forgive me for that. Um, <clears throat> but here's here's Judah who takes a Canaanite woman. So it should be obvious that if Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, that in his lineage, with Judah being at the, at the head of that clan, of the house of Judah, then would have had Canaanite blood in his bloodline, in his heritage. Now he's talking to a Canaanite woman, and one of his disciples was from the land of Canaan, as you brought forth a few episodes ago, John. So it's there's some enigmas here. It makes you wonder. See, the scribes and Pharisees that were attacking him saying, on this particular occasion were saying, we're, we're like purebreds from, the, from, from Abraham. <clears throat> purebreds. They had not... Throughout their lineage, they had not deviated. Is what it sounds like. Okay, they had not. Their lineages had not deviated to Canaanites or Egyptians or anything. They had stayed pure. And they're accusing Jesus because they already knew that Mary, his mother, to them looked like she had born Jesus out of wedlock. And it's only because um, uh, Joseph was a godly man, but also that an angel of the Lord appeared unto him to instruct him, you know, to let him in on what's going on. But it was still subject, even knowing what's going on, still subject to his will. And think of the traditional religious training that Joseph was under that this encounter with the angel, the dream, the vision, you know, would have to rise above his cultural and religious training and background, just like today, in grabbing hold of these advanced concepts that we're discussing on Chronicles, you have to rise above your traditional background, your traditional training. And, you know, in some cases, that traditional background is a very legalistic 6,000 years, and if you don't believe that, you're going to hell. Uh, Adam and Eve were created at 4004 B.C. on this particular day, this particular month, this particular hour, and if you don't believe that, you're going to hell. <laughs> that kind of thing. <clears throat> so Joseph had to rise above his traditional background to the point where he could be running up against the religious right, okay, 
that would have condemned him for being, you know, for accepting Mary in her condition as his wife. And it's only because he accepted her as his wife that the Jesus as his son. Even though it did, Jesus did not come from Joseph's, of Joseph's own loins, he accepted Jesus as though his own son, as though from his own loins. <clears throat> that had, just imagine the pressure that Joseph was under. Here's Mary, who is betrothed to him, and she's with child, not from him. So who she's been sleeping around with, right? That's what the talk of the town, the talk of the countryside, Mary slept around. And under that law of that time, they had every right to take her out to the, outside the city and stone her to death. It's only because Joseph was a godly man, a righteous man, and he rose above the traditional training and teaching and the pressures he was under, rose above to what God was hoping that he would do decide upon and for the benefit of all of us Joseph made the right decisions it's also like Noah <clears throat> you know okay it came down to one man's one person's decision and that was Noah so Noah could have preached righteousness but never built an ark believing that God would have beamed me out of here Scotty kind of thing you know on a spaceship Okay, so he could have not, or maybe he could have built an ark, but never laid up any provisions. Well, I got this ark built, so uh, God will supernaturally wave his supernatural uh, you know, wand, and there will be food and provisions and everything I need in, inside that ark. Noah, Noah had to work. Faith without works is dead. Had Noah not put works into his faith, behind his faith, with his faith, he would have died with his faith along with the unrighteous. Likewise, Joseph, had he stuck with tradition, had he stuck with the religious law of the time, Mary would have been, he would not have married Mary and had every right to have the authorities take her outside the city and stone her to death. And we would not have Jesus as our Savior, our Redeemer, our elder brother, come to rescue us. He would have been killed in the womb. Think about that one, folks. You know, a lot of times we think everything that God does is a done deal. It's a walk through the park, walk through the roses, you know. It's no effort on God's part. He, he bet creation itself. When he sent Jesus into this world, into our world, he placed all of the unfallen two-thirds on the table. You want to talk about gambler? Who's, who's the biggest gambler of them all? It's our Heavenly Father. He gambled all of the unfallen two-thirds, put it right smack dab on top of the table when he sent his son into our world, into this, len, uh, this den of lions that this world is, filled with demons and fallen angels, angelics of every kind and persuasion. Lucifer himself. God put our Father, our Father, put the unfallen two-thirds, put himself, put his holy word <clears throat> on top of the table in view of all of creation, fallen and unfallen, as collateral against the, the last hand that he had to play. And that, that last hand that he had to play was sending his son into our world to die on that cross for you and me. And for anybody to treat that as like was just a walk in the park, Jesus knew he was going to die anyway. He never felt any pain. Man, you you don't know what the Bible's talking. You, if you that's your conclusion, then you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Because <clears throat> I'm telling you, if you do have a personal relationship with Jesus, you can't help but but know, have some kind of inkling of what he went through. That it wasn't automatic. He suffered just like we suffer. And he even suffered more because he took upon himself the sins of the world. He took upon your sins, my sins, and so he sinned them, those very sins himself. So we could be set free. 
This isn't the only life we're going to live, folks. <clears throat> I don't believe in reincarnation, but I do believe this is a life we live here, and there's going to be another life we live somewhere else. <clears throat> and by the decisions we make in this life, we'll determine where we spend eternity. This is the last call. So even if you believe in reincarnation, this is God's last call. You won't get another opportunity to reincarnate any into any place, anywhere else, except hell, lake of fire. <clears throat> For those who believe in reincarnation, if you don't get it right, make the right decision this time, lake of fire will be your eternal destiny. Okay, so God is offering us, through his son, his last call. He put everything on the table. What if Joseph would have decided otherwise? Think of the pressure he was under, the religious pressure he was under to not marry Mary. She could have been stoned to death and Jesus would have died in the womb. And we would not have a Savior. We would not have a Redeemer. We would not have an elder brother. That's how critical it was, folks. Critical. Mission critical. Uh, what it came down to know, again, faith without works is dead. Had he not put any works into behind with his faith, he would have died in his faith along with the unrighteous. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> now, there's something interesting in the book of Revelation. Well, there's a lot of things interesting in the book of Revelation, actually. Uh, see if I can... Got it here. I know I, I located it. Okay, here we go. Okay, Revelation uh, chapter 4, verse 6, and there's another one later on that makes mention to this. It's called a sea of glass. In 4.6 it says, And before the throne, this is before God's throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. <clears throat> but I want to focus on a sea of glass like unto crystal. A sea of glass, when we think of a sea, it's not just some little drop in the bucket or not even a bucket size, not even a size of a pond, not even the size of a lake. We think of a sea, like the Mediterranean Sea, or the, you know, some of these seas, okay? They're, they're big expanses of water. So typically when we think of this in God's throne room, this sea of glass like on a crystal, we might think of like a tabletop, you know, a round tabletop that's glass, and that's about as big as it is in our living room, okay? So we've, we've there again, we've condensed the greatness of, of our Heavenly Father's sea of glass, like on the crystal, onto our, our living room little table, round glass table. Because <laughs> okay. our imaginations are about that big as that glass table. <laughs> okay. Well, in the Cosmic War, the book Cosmic, the Cosmic War by Dr. Joseph Farrell, he mentions this sea of glass as a type of technology that our Father uses to create that he used to create creation as well as to commune or and or commune and transport to various points where um, like this quantum quantum mechanics okay in my opinion quantum is still in the sandbox stage what God our Heavenly Father is capable of is far more advanced than even quantum okay <clears throat> This sea of glass may be a form of technology, a form of where he can take his spoken word and it goes into this sea of glass like unto crystal that then transforms the spoken word into frequencies which create the various elementals, the various elements that then form the various, you know, stars, planets, galaxies, quarks, quarks, uh, nuons, and all the way up to us and other advanced life forms. <clears throat> okay, so 
I would say that even our Heavenly Father has a form of technology that he uses to to have created the original creation as well as to stay in contact, commune, so he can be all places at the same time. So here on earth, we had this place called paradise, the Garden of Eden. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. The Garden of Eden was a, a special place called paradise. I mentioned this before in earlier uh, episodes of the Chronicles, and I think Zen Garcia has has brought this up too, is that this place of paradise was like being a two, having two places that are physically far apart, but as though it was the same place at the same time. Now, a picture in the uh, Cold War era, and uh, you know where you know you had telephones, so you could call anybody on the planet with your telephone. But between the White House and the Kremlin was a dedicated phone line called the red the the red red line or something it was a dedicated phone line a single phone line strung between the white house and the kremlin to avoid a nuclear confrontation and a mistake a mistake that would lead to a nuclear confrontation it was a direct line okay to from us the kremlin from the kremlin to us so picture this paradise as being okay we have this idea of stargates this reality of stargates again you can watch the tv series stargate uh, sg1 and you know that we're already dialing up just like the phone you know if we could dial up any place on the planet but we could have this technology that would literally trans transport us from here to there <clears throat> we wouldn't have to take you know planes trains and automobiles we just dial up a number on the planet and step into our little cubicle and zap, there we are, <laughs> okay, <clears throat> through, the, through the Internet, through the cloud, <laughs> okay, kind of like uh, Star Trek te- technology, beam me up Scotty type of te- technology, only through the, the phone lines, the uh, fiber optic cables, that kind of thing. Okay, so picture stargates where we can dial up anywhere in, in uh, known creation, okay, but this particular stargate that connects God's throne room with our planet here called Paradise is a direct connect, like between the White House and the Kremlin, a direct connect. And it's like connecting two places that are far apart from each other as though they were the same place at the same time. And that, folks, is a technology. Praise God. Could that, and... could that be what they're after? What they're trying to find on this planet is that technology. Could that have been the Tower of Babel resurrecting that technology? And is that where we're headed today? Again, once again, to resurrect that it's direct eight, call to the throne room. 56, 54. <laughs> okay, 52. I'm done. <laughs> 51. <laughs> Hallelujah, we're about to get cut off. That's cool. <laughs> Make a note. Don't forget your spot. We can talk about this on the next show. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. God bless you all. See you next Saturday.